uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn with me to Psalm 119, um, verse 105, uh, and we'll read from there. When I figured out I was reading Psalm 119, I, I thought, you know, if I didn't have anything better to say, I was just going to read the whole thing and just sit down. <laughs> but um, I will spare you that this morning. Um, so, Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth, and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever, they are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. The word of the Lord, will you pray with me? So Lord, as we look at your scripture this morning, we pray that you will teach us, open our ears, open our eyes, and open our minds so that we may know you more and love you deeper. In your name we pray. Amen. So today we're continuing our series, we're kind of in the second half of our series, looking at what we hope the values of Harvard Church are. We're looking at the characteristics of that we have a body of believers want to be defined as, looking at who God might be calling us to be. And this week, we'll be looking at this thing called the Bible, the Word of God, Exploring what that means when we say the Word of God is the center of our life in this, as a church. Now, in our society, the Bible tends to get a bad rap. It's often seen from people outside the church as an outdated tool used by Christians to promote their judgmental views of the world and to justify their hatred of those who are not like them. And in some ways, this has been true. There is a brand of Christianity that claims that their way of understanding the Bible is the only way to understand scripture. To them, all issues of morality can be defined as clear black and white issues and they claim mastery over scripture. And this is the brand that most often uses scripture as a weapon, as a way of judging and condemning the world, whether on protest signs or in the media, and they've hurt all those around them. But there is another brand, and that's the kind that's so embarrassed by their more fundamental brothers and sisters that they've taken the complete opposite track. They've emphasized love and unity at all, at the cost of saying anything that might resemble a hard truth. They've gutted the Bible of anything that might seem problematic or controversial. And so they claim that the Bible is an authority only in so far as it already agrees with their predetermined look on life, and they ignore everything that disagrees with it. My friends, I propose to you today that there is a middle way. And today I want to explore with you what I believe we mean here at the Harbor when we say that the Bible is the Word of God and it's an authority over our lives. First, I think when we say that the Bible is an authority in our lives, we say it because we believe that it is the mouthpiece of God. I remember when I was a teenager, I went to a youth conference in Malaysia with a bunch of friends from my church, and this conference was a huge conference. It's like four to 5,000 youth all coming together to worship God all across Malaysia from all the youth groups in the country. And during the conference, there were some breakout sessions, um, each with their varying themes, like you know, worship leading, one-on-one, how to do it. Um, prayer ministry in your youth group. And because it was a youth conference, we also had the obligatory godly dating um, <laughs> breakout session. But there was one that caught my eye, and that was the wonderfully titled, How to Find the Will of God. So a bunch of us went to that session with eager anticipation because um, we were all semi-obsessed with figuring out how to know what the will of God was in our lives. You see, we had this theory that there was this clear difference between us 
and the leaders that we looked up to. Um, somehow, they seemed to have a stronger connection to God, and we didn't. And so I was excited to go to the session because it felt like an insider secret that I was going to learn. Um, I was finally going to learn the secret of their success, and once I learned what that secret was, I could kick my Christian walk out to the next level. But I'll never forget that the speaker got up to a packed room because apparently other people thought the same thing I was thinking. To a full people, room of people, he said on bated breath, all of you already know the way to find the will of God. So if you're waiting to hear some great secret, you're going to be greatly disappointed. And he said the way to find the will of God, read your Bible, pray every day. This is how God speaks to you. And I left that day feeling extremely disappointed because that advice seemed so rudimentary and so simple. But that story has stuck in my mind because what that speaker said has proven true. The Bible is God's word to us. It's only through reading the Bible that we learn who God is, that he is a God of love, a God who demands justice, a God who's good and it's created us to be good. It is through the Bible that we come to know Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who's come down to forgive us of our sins. It's through the Bible that we learn that God is faithful and trustworthy. He is all powerful and He is all merciful. And when we read about His laws, about His grace, His covenant, and His love, we learn more and more about who He is forming us to be. We learn to look at the world, not with our own eyes, but with His. It is when we root ourselves in the Word of God, we begin to know Him more. This is true in the larger psalm that we read today, in the 176 verses. The psalmist time and time again points to the fact that it is through learning and following the laws of God that he learns of God's faithfulness. That he learns that God is a God of righteousness. That he's good and worthy of trust. And it's, true, it's through dwelling on the law of God that the psalmist learns who God has called him to be. When I was young, I was obsessed with hearing God's voice. And I just had that assumption that God was going to speak to me like through some ethereal light coming down. Telling me what I should do. But the reality is that God has already spoken to us through almost 700,000 words. He has spoken to us in His Word. This Bible that we hold in our hands is one of the greatest gifts that He has given to us. It's the largest source of revelation for us. And we will only be able to hear Him still speaking to us today when our lives are rooted in this Word when we're firmly under the Word's authority. So the Bible is our authority because it is how God speaks to us first. But secondly, the Bible is an authority because it is our guide. Thy words are lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I didn't really appreciate the importance of what it means to have something guide your life until I found myself seriously lost one time. I used to be a scuba, I used to scuba dive a lot as a teenager. Uh, I was, I really loved doing it. Um, and one of the things I really liked about scuba diving was that it was one of the safest extreme sports out there. Um, there are so many inbuilt safety checks and rules and regulations in this sport. So much so that you know, if you followed all the rules, you would eliminate almost 99% of any potential danger to yourself. But I had that one dive when I didn't follow all the rules. I'd been diving on this beautiful island in off the coast of Malaysia called Pulau Redang. And I'd been doing this for about two to three times a day for about a week. It was a great time. There was so much to see. And this was the last dive that I was going to do before I head, headed home. But when I woke up that morning, because I'd been diving two to three times for almost a week, a day. I, when I woke up, my body was sore. 
My nose was congested and I was exhausted. I, was, I wasn't feeling 100% that morning. But I stubbornly decided I'm still going to go. Which was the first rule I broke. Diving when my body was not up for it. And when I was out on the dive site, I started descending and I got a problem that I got, you know, once in a while, which was I had trouble equalizing my ears. Equalizing your ears, you know, that's the feeling you get in an airplane, your ears, you, you feel like your ear needs to pop. When you go underwater, it's about 20 times worse. So my ears were in, cons were in great pain now, taking a really long time to descend. And everyone else was by the bottom waiting for me so a few of us decided that, you know, you know, we'll hold back. You guys go on ahead and we'll catch up with you. Which was breaking the second big rule. The group always goes together. You don't split up. We should have either waited as one group or sent me back up to sit on the boat or everyone abandoned the dive at that point. And we broke rule number three pretty soon after because um, as the big larger group started disappearing, we didn't really pay attention what direction they were going to. We had a rough, vague idea, but we didn't check our compasses to make sure that it was actually the right direction they were going to. And the thing about it is that when you descend underwater, a group of rocks that you think are really distinctive to follow, turns out there are about 10 other distinctive rocks that you could have followed. Um, and when you only have 40 feet of visibility, people disappear really fast. And so that's how I ended up going in the complete opposite direction of the larger group and ended up on the surface completely stranded in the middle of the ocean for about 45 minutes. Now, as you can see, it turned out all right. I'm still alive. <laughs> We got rescued eventually, but what struck me about that experience was how fast a safe sport became potentially dangerous and life-threatening because we chose to break several safety regulations. And that is precisely what I think happens when we are people who are not rooted in the Word of God. The Word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. This phrase has been used so much that I think it's perhaps lost its meaning for us, but what the psalmist is basically reminding us is that the Word of God has been given to us so that we don't get lost, so we don't go astray. The Word of God is our guide. It's the safety regulations that lead us through life, through potentially dangerous and treacherous territory. It's what brings us to safe ground. And we need the Word of God as our guide because on our own, we are a people prone to wander, prone to going astray. The psalmist reminds us of this in verse 109. He writes, I constantly take my life into my own hands. We are a people who on our own are motivated by self-preservation, by our self-interest, by our self-glory. On our own, we're a people fallen and sinful. We're a people who choose the path of least resistance. On our own, we will settle for less, choose comfort over being challenged, choose to be entertained rather than to serve, choose the easy life rather than to take up our cross and follow him. In Matthew 7, we see that when we choose our own path, we will be the people who choose the wide gate and the broad road that leads to our destruction. And more importantly, on our own, there is nothing that we can do that will keep us from going on this path that leads to our destruction. No amount of intellect or talent or passion, there's no amount of know-how or wealth or resources or entrepreneurship, no amount of hard work or discipline will keep us from our destruction. On our own, left to our own devices, 100% of the time, we will not find a path that leads to life and salvation, but we will choose the path to hell. And here's the wonderful thing about God's grace, because he doesn't, he doesn't leave us to our own devices. 
He knows we are prone to destruction, prone to wonder. And so he has poured out his grace upon us. He does this most importantly in the life and death of Jesus Christ, the living word who washes us clean, forgives us of our sins. But he has also given us his word, this Bible that we hold in our hands. He has given us the very guidebook to help us escape the wide path of destruction and find the narrow path that leads to eternal life. We will find a path when we root ourselves in God, in God and in His Word, when we allow the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and see the love, the hope, and the joy that is springing from these words of life. But finally, and perhaps most importantly, the Word of God is an authority over us in that it is our teacher. Now let me th tell you what I think when I mean by this. Um, I think often I've approached scripture thinking that it was something that I needed to have mastery over. I approached scripture thinking that this was a tool that I needed to perfect using. I simply had to learn enough about the Bible, study it thoroughly, spend enough time in school learning about it, and like any other tool that I use, I would then be able to wield it and use it for my own purposes. But well, you see, the problem with, there's a problem with thinking that um, Scripture is a tool that we need to use. First, it means that the power, once again, lies with us. It means that the impetus is on me to gain the knowledge, to gain the skills, to gain the techniques necessary to unlock the tool and gain mastery over it. It implies that I remain the one in authority. But second, it implies that, you know, just like any good tool, there are perhaps other tools that I could use. I remember when I was younger, I didn't like reading the Bible because, and it's extremely cliche for me to say it, I found it boring. But because I did care about my faith, and I did care about growing in my faith, I became an expert in surrounding myself with other things besides the Bible that I could use to grow my faith. You know, Perhaps I'll do a prayer journal, I'll buy a whole bunch of Christian music and I'll listen exclusively to it. I'll read a whole bunch of books on theology, I'll have many great conversations with my Christian friends about faith. I'll get really involved in church, I'll volunteer my time, I'll do any number of other Christian things. And I fooled myself into thinking that because I was doing all these other things, that was an adequate substitute for my lack of reading scripture. But I've come to realize that Scripture is not a tool or something I'm called to have mastery over. But Scripture is my teacher. And I am its student. And the relationship I'm called to have as a student of Scripture is radically different than if I'm its master. First, when Scripture is my teacher, it implies that Scripture has the authority to change me. So often the church goes wrong when it tries to use scripture to fit its own agenda. And I've talked to so many Christians who have gone astray because they would only listen to scripture when they agreed with it in the first place and would ignore it when they disagreed. But if I am called to be a student of scripture, that means I'm openly admitting that there are many things that need to change within me. It means that I admit that there are times when I am wrong. It means that I probably am wrong about how I approach all of life. Like how I approach my relationships. I might be wrong about my concepts of what success and ambition are. That my priorities in life may be skewed and that my concepts of what is right and wrong are probably misguided. It means that I have to be open to the fact that when I, what I think a Christian looks like and acts like may be different than my default. And I have to assume that maybe my, what I think my calling in life may be open to change. It means every day I have to be willing to repent. I once heard a professor say, you know, if you read scripture, like in your daily devotions, and you come away without any conviction within you that 
something needs to change in you. That there's something you might need to repent of. Then you've not read scripture right. If we are students of scripture, then we come to it every day, whether we've been Christians for days or decades, with the belief that scripture can change us. But secondly, if we are students, it means that we are not called to know everything about Scripture. Scripture isn't something that we're just supposed to figure out and then put away and move on to something else. There won't be a moment in our lifetimes when we will say that we have gleaned everything there is to know about a book or about a passage or about a verse of Scripture. And this is because the God who we serve the God who is in Scripture, He is infinitely knowable. His greatness and majesty and mystery go beyond all of our abilities to comprehend. And this means that as students, we will always be called to dig deeper and deeper into Scripture. And we should expect and maybe welcome the fact that sometimes we'll stumble upon a passage that we do not fully understand. Sometimes you may stumble upon a passage that's fundamentally going to alter the way I think about the world. Sometimes a favorite passage that I've looked over over and over and over again may still offer up something new about God and who God is. We're not called to know everything about Scripture and about God, but we are called to continue learning about we're called to wrestle with the passages we don't understand and have sleepless nights over the past parts of the Bible we may not be agreeing with at the moment. We're called earnestly to dive deeper and deeper into the Word of God, always expecting that we will learn something new about Him or about this world He's created or about our calling within it. And we can dive in and not be worried about knowing fully because when we encounter scripture, we encounter the true and living God who has promised to lead us into paths of righteousness and truth. So in closing, this is why I think at the harbor, our commitment to have scripture as an authority over us, that needs to be one of the central pillars of our identity. We will be a people who willingly submit to the authority of scripture. We submit to its authority first because it's the mouthpiece of God, the clearest revelation of who God is and who we are called to be. But we submit to Scripture also because it's our shepherd and our guide. It's, it is the one thing that will keep us from going our own way and going astray. And finally, we submit to Scripture because it is the ever eternal teacher through all times and seasons teaching us more and more, and shaping us for each and every new day. So the call today, again, is simple. It has, an, it has that childlike simplicity to it. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. But are we willing to believe that it's truly that simple? And will we then be willing to be a people will follow that simple call, read your Bible, pray every day, earnestly? Will we have the Word of God rooted in our hearts as our teacher, our guide, and our sustenance? And will we be a people who will commit to do this together, to challenge each other and to spur each other to know Him and love Him more and to dive deeper into the great mystery that is the Word of God? And most important, importantly, <clears throat> Will we be a people who will then allow God, through His Holy Word, to change us, to shape us, to challenge us, and to send us out into the world, to proclaim to the world the truth of the Gospel that sets us free? Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word because it's such a great gift to us. We thank you for the ways you've revealed yourself 
to us and revealed all your love and mercy and grace and hope and truth. And we pray that we will, um, we will not look to other ways to find our fulfillment, but we will dive deep into this word. And we pray that as we do, you reveal yourself more and change us. We pray and ask this evening. Amen.